this church that step up and make this ministry work. We're very appreciative of every one of you. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to be part of the family of God. Let's look at John chapter 11 tonight. <clears throat> Chapter 11, verse 1, uh, now a certain, uh, you see man, that's italicized, that means that's not there in the original language. Now a certain was sick. What have we learned about when we see this word? Well, we've got out there and thought a bunch of things, but I think we've landed on believer or unbeliever, believer or unbeliever. And so a certain man, a believer or an unbeliever, we know that by knowing who he is and everything that this is Lazarus and, and that he's a believer. So the certain was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now what happened right there is John just gave us a little peek into the next chapter, into chapter 12, where you will see that Mary was preparing his body for burial. But, but Mary isn't quite there yet. We're going to see this chapter is going to bring her to that place. Verse 4, when Jesus heard, he said, this sickness is, whoa, 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 I skipped a verse. I'm sorry. Verse 3. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. The word is phileo. There's three kinds of love. There's uh, phileo, which is brotherly or friend love. That's where we get our word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's phileo. That's what was used here. There is uh, eros, which is the sexual kind of love that a man or a woman has for their spouse or uh, if you want to get out there and sin or whatever. It's that kind of love. And then there's agape, which is the sacrificial love that comes from God. Okay, I just wanted to nail that down before we move forward. <clears throat> when Jesus heard that, verse 4, he said, uh, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved. Uh, the word is agapao. It is... The word agape is the love of God, the noun. This agapao is the verb of that same love. It, in this case, and in a lot of times when we see this being applied uh, from a human, this is a human expression of the love of God. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what's what this is. That's agapao. Jesus loved he had that sacrificial love of God in human form for Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, knowing, now I'm going to nail this down here, knowing that Jesus had uh, that love that only comes from God for them, that special love. As a matter of fact, if you look up the definition of agapao, it means to welcome, to entertain, to be fond of, to love dearly. So, he loved them dearly. I want to nail that down. Is everybody on the page with me? That Jesus loved these three dearly. He was friends with them. They were like family to him. I'm going to say that they share a love like Brian and I have. Or like Ron and I have. Or like Scotty and I have. So that kind of like Patrick and I have. It's, it's tight. It means something. It's a, okay? You with me? And so, since uh, Lazarus was sick and he means so much to them... Uh, he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, verse 6, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed there two more days. Does that make sense? From, from human perspective, it makes no sense. He loved them so much that when he heard that Lazarus was deadly sick, that he just kept doing what he was doing. He just hung out there for a couple more days. Well, I'll get to it in a little while. I'll, I'll get around to it sooner or later. But you see, there's more. There's more to the story. There's more going. There's a more important issue at hand. We're going to get to it in just a minute. I'll point this out. I think I will. The Lord's driving the car right now, so I'm really not sure where we're going. 
He stayed two more days in the place where he was. Verse 7. And then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered and said, are, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. Who is, what, who is the light of the world? Jesus, if you walk with me, okay, you see that? All right, let's jump back over here to John chapter 9, verse 4 for a second. And Jesus said, when they saw the blind man there, they walked by him. And the disciples asked him, said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And, and he said, he said uh, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but, the, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Verse 4, nine, chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. While the light is here with you. Okay? The night is coming when no one can work. Darkness is coming. Depravity is coming. There is a time coming when the light will be removed from the world. Am I bringing this into your political environment here? Are you seeing this kind of thing happen? We need to be working while the light is here because there's a day coming that darkness and depravity and the word for night, not, not this word in, in our text in chapter 11, it, the word for night there is nooks and, and it doesn't mean the same thing. But over in another place, it's another word. What it means is ignorance, lack of understanding. And I think that over in chapter 9, that's what that word was, is that there is going to be a lack of understanding. There is going to be a lack of wisdom. There is going to be a lack of Jesus accompanying me. There's going to be a lack of enlightenment coming. Friends, neighbors, it's knocking on our door. Now, okay, let me keep going for a little bit before I chase that rabbit. But we will chase the rabbit. Are there not 12 hours in the day? In other words, you got... You got half of the 24 that's in the light. We're going to walk in the light here. If you walk in the light, you don't stumble. But he who sees, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, in the, the word is nooks, it's N-Y-X, I think. And it describes the time when the drunks pass out and go to bed. When the people are out in the darkness doing the sinning. Yeah, you, you following me? If he walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. He'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was talking about taking rest in sleep. I wrote in my margin here in red letters, because I can almost hear Jesus saying it. Gee whiz. Wow. But you know what the bottom line is here? They don't want to go. They, they don't want to do this. The, the disciples, they're not wanting to do this. First of all, it was, Lord, they're trying to stone you over there. Why are we going back there? Well, they're not wanting to get into that. I don't want to get into all that stoning, all that fear. They're afraid. They don't want to go do that. I don't want to go do this. Do we have to go do this? They're trying to stone you there. Let's go do this. Well, Lazarus is asleep. We need to go wake him up. Well, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Right? They don't want to do it. <laughs> Gee whiz. Verse 14. Then Jesus said to them plainly, he's dead. <laughs> wow. He's dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Now, then Thomas, who is called the twin, Thomas is the Hebrew, Didymus is the Greek, it means twin. And there's all kinds, you get the phone book on what that description of his personality is. But right here, how many people are familiar with Winnie the Pooh? How many people know who Eeyore is? Oh, that, that's, 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 that's what we got right here. Now listen. And Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, 
Let us also go that we may die with him, Pooh. <laughs> now, I've read some commentaries on this. And some people are really supportive of Thomas, like he was willing to go to the death right then with Jesus. And that may have been true. I don't know. I can't tell you what he But for me, I wrote Eeyore right here because that's what it sounds like. Well, let's go. Let's die with him. You know, unable to see at this point, unable to see that there's a bigger mission uh, on the board here that, that Jesus is trying to accomplish. Now, we've seen this story unfold from the beginning of John chapter 1 and step up in its intensity and in its uh, importance. And he is eliminating and doing away with things that are normal fears in the flesh, okay? Now, I, I, did a little, I researched this a little bit. I'm not wanting to know if I'm wanting to commit the time to it or not. I don't know. Let's truck on a little bit. He's dead, verse 15. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. What's the purpose in this? In all this, he just said it. That the people would believe. Believe what? The same thing that all of the law and all of the prophets that God said through every one of them. There's judgment coming. There's this that's going to happen. That's going to happen. But at the end of it, at the end of it, I'm doing this so that they will know that I'm the Lord. We need to adopt this kind of vision right now. And it's more crucial that we do than any other time in history as far as my 56 years that I've been involved in history. That we need to understand that there is a bigger picture right now. Because the world is ensued with chaos. The, the, the institutions and the, the people and the, the, the government things, the offices and the entities that we have always been able to rely on and trusted with our lives without questioning them at all, they can't be trusted anymore. The media that has broadcasted our information to us and that have always been kind of seen as on our side, we always thought we could trust the media, they can't be trusted anymore. There's an agenda that's going on here. And I'm telling, I want to remind you that what is the, the objective of the enemy? Satan, what's his objective? Steal, kill, destroy, confuse, accuse. It's, it's, it's what we're seeing. You can be mad at the Biden administration if you want to. And I share in that frustration. But he's a pawn on God's chessboard. You can be mad at Putin if you want to. And you can think that Trump is going to ride in and save the day if you want to. But I want to remind you, Christian people, that there is a bigger agenda on the world scene that's happening here today. And it is so that they will know that I'm the Lord. Pawn. On a chessboard. Brian brought it out in Ezekiel out of 38 over there where God said, uh, you're, you're going to see this and this and these powers are going to surround Israel. And it's going to look grim and it's going to look bleak. But I've got a hook in their jaw and it's me that's drawing them in. And they're going to get down here and you're going to think it's over. And then they're going to turn on each other and destroy each other. But Israel ain't going nowhere. All this is happening so that we will know that he's the Lord. All this in this chapter is happening. It's Jesus pulling out all the stops. Not so you'll think, not so your opinion will shift, but so that you will know that I'm the Lord. That I'm God incarnate, that I'm God in the flesh, that God stepped down out of heaven and put on an earth suit and dwelled among us and explained the Father and displayed the agape of God on the cross of Calvary to redeem us. Okay, Lord, go ahead on. Go ahead on. Just do it. I didn't plan that. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. It's about a mile and a quarter from the Mount of Olives. And so when Jesus is on the Mount of Olives doing his prayer time and his communing with God and everything, he can... 
look. I, I'm going to say, I, I'm, I'm guessing here, this isn't scriptural. This is Glenn talking. It's not God talking. So just, just take it with a grain of salt. But from the Mount of Olives with the picturesque view that he had, be, seeing how he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus the way that he did, and he was so affectionate toward them, I'm going to say that he looked off that Mount of Olives a lot of times at that mile and a quarter and said, and Father, remember my friends. How many of you know that Jesus is looking down from the mount where he is now and he's saying father help Heath and Allie father help help Randy and Patrick help them know that I'm the Lord help them understand that there's something bigger here than what the eye can see and the skin can touch and the, the human finite understanding can perceive help them Lord I see God, my, my friends at Calvary Chapel, and I'm asking you, Lord, that you would clarify their vision and help them understand that there's something greater going on here than death. There's something greater going on here than coronavirus. There's something greater going on here than all this. Choose your words carefully, Glenn. Espionage. that's happening in our government. The evil is taking over. Jesus said that there would be a day in the last days when iniquity or lawlessness would abound to the point that the love of people would grow cold and if possible, even the elect would be deceived. It's time for us to fixate and Focus and intensify our faith on the one who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. The one who created all life and heavens and earth and everything in them. The one who has the power. Romans says he gives, he's the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that aren't as though they were. He's God. So when Jesus came, verse 17, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Without any embalming or anything of the sort, you take a dead body and... Heath, you're in the medical field. You know about this kind of stuff. Brittany, you know about this kind of stuff. You take a dead body and roll it off into a tomb and roll a rock over the hole... How long does it take that for that to get pretty start the, the uh, what is it called, the decay, the decomposition to start? How long? Hours, they said, if you didn't hear him, hours. He's been there four days. What do you think that's like? <sighs> I'm sorry, when my grandson walks in, I get distracted. <laughs> Verse 18, now Bethany was, oh, we already did that. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Verse 19, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Verse 20, now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house, so she's depressed. Verse 21, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know. Really? Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother, the reason I picked that song, will rise again. Your brother will rise again. Now, listen, these are the friends. These are the believers. These are the ones that's supposed to be sold out right here, okay? Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Verse 25, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if you've gotten distracted by my nonsense, I want you to zone in on me here for a minute, okay? Christians, 
you need to understand this, you need to adopt this, you need to own this, you need to embrace this. <clears throat> I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the source of life. I'm the one who calls, raises the dead back to life and gives life to the dead and calls the things that aren't as though they were. He who believes in me, though he may die, and I don't know why they use may, because we will certainly die. This body will die. He shall live. Though he may die, he shall live. Verse 26, and here's the part that I want you to focus in on, man. I want you to understand this. And whoever lives and circle and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, what did he just say? Huh? He who lives and believes in me. Now, when you couple a couple of words like that with a conjunction like and in the middle, it, it, the proper English has, says that you have to be able to use them individually. So, he who lives in me shall never die. And he who believes in me shall never die. And means both. We got a lot of people believing that Jesus is real these days. We don't have a lot of people that are willing to live in him. And so my question for you tonight is, whether you're in the building or whether you're on the broadcast, how are you living? Are you living in him? Are you believing in him? You've heard it come out of my mouth up here that the first things are first and all you got to do is believe. If you just believe in him, then your behavior will follow. But that's not always the case because sometimes we believe he's real, but I don't want to invest in that. The days of half-hearted commitments are over. It's not adequate anymore in these times. Darkness is beginning to prevail. And that means that our lights aren't shining brightly enough. We need to be, and I'm not saying that you need to clean up the old act and be more religious and be more law abiding and this kind of thing. I'm saying that we have to be more committed to the person of Jesus of Nazareth in these last days because the time of his return is very near. Evil and darkness and lawlessness are abounding in the world today. All the things that we have placed our hope in over the years of our lives, all those things that we may have trusted in over the course of our lives, they are evaporating right before our very eyes right now. And the only thing that's going to remain when we walk up to the end of of life is the resurrection. Our hope isn't in this world. Our hope is in the resurrection. It, it, this body's going to die. It can't go to heaven. It's not wired right. We got to be glorified. We have to sow the mortality and be raised in immortality. We have to sow the perishable and we have to be raised in imperishable. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like. With the trumpet blows this afternoon and Jesus comes back into the clouds and calls his church up to meet him in the air. I don't know if there's going to be some magic transformation along the way and, and all that stuff. Or I don't know. We were talking about this in the elders meeting before the church. I don't know if I'm, my soul is going to get yanked up out of this earth suit and it's going to drop on for the carcass for somebody else to do away with. I don't know. And I don't care. All I know is that I want to be a part of this resurrection. Now these ladies and these Jews who are comforting these people around here are faced with mortality. Death has happened to someone they love. They're looking at it straight in the face. They're out of options. There's nothing that they can do. We are out of options, friends. A politician can't save us. Better government, better policies can't save us. More money's not going to help us. What we need in these end days is more Jesus. We need the life that only he can give. Because he is 
the resurrection. He is the life. And for all those who will live in Him and believe in Him will never die. How many of you want to be part of that? I want to go to that party. Brian was talking about the Ark of the Covenant this morning. What all was in it. The, the, the Ten Commandments were in it. and The manna was in it. You know what else was in it? The staff that Aaron carried. Why was it in there? Because it had been cut off of a tree for who knows how long and been stabbed in a sand herding sheep for years, but it budded. Everything in that Ark of the Covenant is a picture of Jesus Christ. What God would do, His declaration, His logos, His gospel message, His good news that He declared that became flesh. I am the resurrection. Aaron's bud was in the Ark of the... Aaron's staff that budded was in the Ark of the Covenant because he is the resurrection. He is the life. If, if God through Ezekiel could prophesy to the dead bones and the meat and the skin and the life and the breath would come back into them and the life of the land and everything that they represented can happen, then don't think that we are up against an, in, uh, an insurmountable foe with this coronavirus junk. He is the resurrection. And he demonstrated that when this old stick came back to life. Let's back up. Verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He's asking her, I'm asking you, do you believe this? That there is a resurrection awaiting all those who are in Christ Jesus? Do you believe that? Because if we do, that needs to be our focal point and not all this confusion. Yes, the world we live in is evil. Yes, I got evil in me. I'm wicked on the inside. But you know what? It's not me that I'm trusting in. It's the provision of the cross that the one who gives life to the dead and calls those things that are not as though they were has the power and the ability and the willingness to put in me and take me into eternity. Do you believe this? She said to him, verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God who is to come into the world. Verse 28, And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, Who? Who, 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 who who's, who's here? The teacher, what, what, okay, let's back, back up again, now, now, let's don't forget where we came from, let's go back to John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1, where John, the writer of the gospel, testified right out of the gate in 1-1 one, one that said that the word, the declaration, the logos, the gospel message that came out of God's mouth became flesh. John's testimony that, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The, the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan. The gathering of his disciples. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2. We start dealing with some of these things. This story is unfolding as we go along, okay? Everything that we fear, everything that we have no control over, everything that we're insecure and anxious about, these things he's dealing with 
one at a time. Okay, so in, in, in chapter 2, uh, we had the wedding at the Cana, at Cana of Galilee, and, and there was a crisis, you see. How many crises Christians do you know? That they get in this crisis, and they come to the Lord, and then they turn around, and they go, well, I like this a little better, and they wander off out there, oh my goodness, uh, and then it's a crisis. Okay, so there's a crisis at the wedding. They're out of wine. Oh my goodness, this is going to be embarrassing, this is going to be terrible. But add Jesus to it, and the water becomes wine. Joy, a miracle. That was just one that he did for a favor for his mama. <laughs> she said, they're out of why. What does it got to do with me? Okay, do what he says. Took back the temple. The, the temple was a place of uh, where they were exploiting. Is that right? Exploit. I'm a little, I'm a little wired right now. Took back the temple. People were using it to exploit the Jews, take advantage of them. Uh, you had this incredible exchange. Well, you bring it. Oh, man, that lamb's no good. But I tell you what, we got one over here. It's going to cost about three times more than what you would give to it at a regular farm market. But we will do you a favor because you need one that's pre-approved. But you can't use that money. You're going to have to go exchange it. There was an incredible exchange rate. So they're exploiting. They're robbing the people. And they were set up making money on the temple of God. And Jesus drove them out with a whip. Get out of here. My house is my father's house, the house of prayer. And you've turned it into a den of robbers. Chapter 3, the religious man, Nicodemus, comes up. Comes to him at night. He doesn't want to be caught by the other Jews or by the religious establishment because he doesn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue or done away with. So he comes to him at night. And he's telling him without saying the words, I, I, I'm a believer. I worship God. I love God. But there's something missing. Missing in my life. This religious system isn't giving me what I need because I need life. And Jesus shared with him that you got to be born again. You were born into sin and death. You got to be born again into life in the Spirit. Chapter 4 The woman at the well. This woman who was rejected and condemned and looked down upon. She was in hiding, she done had five husbands. She's laid up with another man looking for satisfaction in the things of the flesh and the things of the world. And she thinks that she don't have a snowball's chance in hell of ever having a relationship with God. But Jesus shows up. And he shows her that, no, you're just who I'm looking for. And she gets saved and becomes a powerful witness. And he heals this nobleman's son from way off with a spoken word. So sickness and disease. And we got the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda that's been laying there all of his life looking for the stirring of the water. Putting his hope in some stirring by an angel or anything else. And Jesus says, no, you need to believe in me. And heals him. He debates with the Pharisees about that the law and the prophets were writing about him. I am the one who was to come. Then he fed the 5,000, walked on water, healed all the sick, claims to be the bread from heaven and the light of the world, and describes his sacrificing of his flesh on the cross at Calvary to redeem us lost souls in this world. Chapter 7. He identifies that the struggle is internal. It's not external. You can't separate from the sin or get far enough away from it. Randy, I can't stay away, far enough away from it and not just get remove a bottle of liquor from my environment and think that I'm healed of my alcoholism. It's on the inside. Chapter 7. Chapter 8, he forgives the adulteress, the one whom everybody looked down their nose at. She deserves to be stoned. Well, okay, if you're innocent, you throw the first stone. Love, grace, forgiveness. <laughs> believer, versus in, believer versus in believer. And the consequences that follow that choice, the struggle's internal. Forgives the adulteress. Makes the I am statements. Identifies Abraham's seed versus Satan's seed. Is as much as a simple choice. But to believe in the son of God who's standing before you. Working the works of the father that can't be denied. And you still refuse to believe. Chapter 9. Restores the blind man's sight. Chapter 10, the Good Shepherd illustrations promotes, promotes family over religion, teaches knowing him over religious practice. Chapter 11, after displaying the power over all these things, 
We come to the final fear, the final enemy, the greatest fear, the thing that if you're honest with yourself here tonight, that every one of us fear, and that's death. Am I going to make it through this? Am I going to be able to avoid death? Or if I don't avoid death, am I going to be able to I have any hope beyond that? Can anybody say that, yeah, okay, that, that's a concern of mine. Lazarus is dead. He's dead. He's... That's not the end. <laughs> You're Lazarus. I'm Lazarus. It's not the end. Aaron's staff was dead. It wasn't the end, though. <sighs> she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Verse 28, and when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come. Not that you just told him you were the Christ. He was the Christ. Yeah, I believe you're the Son of God. But she says, the teacher, the teacher has come. Not the Christ, not the Messiah, not God incarnate, not Emmanuel, God with us, not the one who has the power of life and death in the very words that he speaks, not this guy. She's still not believing. Teacher's coming, is calling for you. Verse 29, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. Because she was weeping. She was depressed. Verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. The word groaned right there. How, what, what do you think that what do you think that is? This has been so badly interpreted that that that, that, it, that it's sad. The word is embrimiomai. 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 Let me tell you what it means. It means to snort with anger. Do you remember that feeling you was talking about in your gut that this has done got real? I've got to do something? That's what he has right here. It's embrimiomai. And it means to snort with anger. To charge sternly. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Most famous two-word verse in the whole Bible right here, verse 35, Jesus wept. Now listen to this, because this is your reaction too if you're not careful, if you're not looking at this right. And then the Jews said, oh, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? And then Jesus again groaning in himself He's angry. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Now Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time, there's a stench for he's been dead four days. She still doesn't believe. He's already told her. The reason the source for the embrimiomai is back up here. In verse 23, and Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he'll rise in the resurrection of the last day. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though he die, he'll live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And she's getting that reaction that pastors get a lot of times when we're saying, do you believe this? And they go. And they haven't heard a word you said. It's frustrating. 
Because the place where he is right here, the place where they are right here, is a lot like where we are in life, that the stakes are higher now. The way that we've inadvertently and lackadaisically gone to church and done the things and all the stuff, it's not adequate anymore because the stakes are higher. The situation in the world is growing more and more dim. The time of his return is closer. I'm trying, this is, uh, this is Jesus. I'm trying, I have been trying for 10 chapters here to display the power over every earthly thing and every fleshly thing and every mindset that might convince you that God doesn't like you or he's mad at you and that you're going to go to hell or whatever the religious beliefs are. If I don't clean up my act, God's mad at me and he's ashamed of me and he's not going to help me and so on and so forth. He has done away with all this stuff. Every crisis that could happen in any party, every illness, every Every incapacity, everything. And right now we're up against death and he's trying to get them to see. He's not performing miracles because he's on an ego trip. He's not saying, what well, y'all watch this? Hold my beer. It's so the people will believe. Because it's critical. It's where we are. We're staring death in the face. Now, do you believe that there's something beyond that or not? Do you believe that he has a greater plan and the power to give life to the dead and call things that are not as though they were? We witness it every day in the lives of the people that are part of this family. You've seen the resurrection. You're looking at it. 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 Resurrection from the dead. That's Jesus. He, the tide is turning. We're turning a corner here. We're fix, he's fixing to go to the cross. He has a limited amount of time. While it's still day. While the light of the world is here so that you can see. We've got to get this work done. He wasn't limited. They were. By their own minds. And if we're not real careful. With all the fear and chaos that's going on. We'll be limited by our own minds also. I want you to hear me church. I'm not up here just yelling and throwing a fit. Because it's what I enjoy doing. Although I do. But. The way we've gone about church isn't adequate anymore because we're staring death and chaos in the face. And everybody in this world's not going. And we, we believe we've lived our life believing the rhetoric that's come out of the church that if you'll just walk up here and say these words and do this thing, then you can go home and live like a heathen if you want to. And well, I said the word and I got wet. I put some money in the basket. I've checked the boxes. I've done my deed. No. He told him in the last chapter, no, I, you need to know me. My sheep know my voice. They follow me. I care for them. We need to know him. Now that doesn't look religious. But it looks committed and it looks faithful. And it looks like, I believe you. I believe what you're saying in this word enough to investigate it and figure out what's really being said. Okay, let's finish this up. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, <laughs> let's back up a minute. Martha, the sister of him who was dead after all this teaching, said, Lord, by this time there's a stench for he's been dead four days. And Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? Didn't I say that? Did I say that? Did he say that? Upset. Why? Because he loves them, man. 
man, you're not getting this. You're looking at this through eyes of the flesh. You're looking at this for what you're able to do instead of trusting in me. He loves them, man. Just like he loves you, he loves us. I could go off on a tear right there, but I'm not going to do it. Verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Verse 42, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. There's the objective for all the miracles. There's the objective for everything that he's done so that they would believe that he was the one that came from God, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Christ. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. This guy's dead. He stinks. He's wrapped up in grave clothes. Look, look. He, he walked like, kind of like, you know, I wouldn't do it with anybody else in the house. But there's nobody here for me if I got to get up and get something, you know, off the pot. <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's wrapped up his face. All he did was respond to the voice of the Lord. Come forth. So he did. Go, you're going to have to turn him loose. He's bound. 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things Jesus did believed in him. Objective. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council... Well, they always got to get a committee together, don't they? <laughs> and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. Verse 48, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Now, here's your motive. And the Romans will come and take away both our, our place and our nation. And we're talking about the nation of Israel. Whose nation is it? God's. Whose place is it? God's. They don't have any place. But they think they got some power and they don't want to lose that. The Romans are going to come and take it away if everybody believes in him. We're not going to have the standing and the prestige and everybody's not going to look up to us anymore if they follow this guy out. We got to do something. Verse 49, then one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You don't know anything. 50, nor do you consider that it is expedient that's beneficial for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Verse 51, now he, this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Now, 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 wait a minute. Now, hold on a minute. Now, wait a minute. Now, now, he prophesied this. That means that his words came from God. That it was divinely inspired of the Holy Spirit. A prophecy was given that this Jesus would be the one who would die for the nation. And not just this nation, but all nations. And that he would be the shepherd that Jesus talked about in the illustration in chapter 10. That the sheep would become one flock under one shepherd. And he is the Savior. And this was prophesied out of his mouth. But his beliefs are so skewed by tradition. Uh, that the accurate prophecy from their own high priest's mouth. They didn't get it. Either that or they still looking so highly of themselves that they think, well, if he's going to be the one to die for the nation anyway, let's just help God out. This is the motive. This is where the table turns. This is where Jesus starts heading for the cross. And they're after him. It's skewed. Religion skews our view. It skews our vision. It distorts 
and destroys the truth of the gospel message that God loves his children and is reaching out to his children and has lived the life that we couldn't live, died the death that we couldn't die but deserve to, and took our place, the old switcheroo, that he died the death that I couldn't die or that it wouldn't have done any good if I had. He died on the cross as if he lived my life so that I could live now as though I lived his. Verse 53, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. That's a joke. I shouldn't have said that. That was ugly. 56. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood, as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? 57. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. He's proven to them that he's the Christ and that he has power over every problem, every fear, everything that we face, that we are insecure and don't have the power to fix for ourselves, that he is the answer to all the problems, whether they be social or physical or emotional. Or he even has power over death. The choice for us is do we believe the gospel or do we believe that we need to help God out and clean up our act a little bit or do we believe in what Jesus has said because those who live in him and believe in him, this stuff has no power over us. It's all about Jesus. It's about being set free. It's about trusting in what he has done, not what I've done. I had some people come up here this morning and they were afraid because it's, they're in fear because of their inabilities to meet their own unrealistic expectations about what righteousness is. We have to be clothed in his righteousness. We're flesh, we're flawed, we're faulty, we're ridiculous. It's about allegiance to the one whom God sent. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, God, that leads us and guides us and helps us to understand what the real truth is in the world that we're living in today or truth is a thing of the past it's like we're bankrupt on truth it's like everything that we see and everything that we read is is a lie i pray god that you'd motivate us with the power of the holy spirit to cling to our bibles lord and cling to the spirit because it's the only source of truth that we have and so lord bring us in close to yourself and help us to discern what's truth so that we can endure everything that's before us all the way to the resurrection, Lord. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.